Hi, my name is AJ from We Learn to Share, and today we'll be learning. Today we will again learn about Unit 5 Heredity. This will be the second half, the second part after the class last week on the part one. If you haven't watched that, go ahead, watch that video, part one molecular basis before you watch this video. All right, table of contents. Number one, Mendelian genetics. What Mendelian genetics is and its mechanism. Uh, part number two, Mendelian disorders, notable genetic disorders in humans that are Mendelian. And number three, non-Mendelian genetics, exceptions to me Mendel's discovery. So some genes and uh, these uh, inherit inheriting um, patterns that are non-Mendelian. Number four, environmental effects. How does the environment affect our phenotype? Number five, linked genes. What are, what are linked genes and gene maps? And lastly, number six, we will go over sex-linked genes, uh, genes on the sex chromosomes. Number one, Mendelian genetics. So who is Gregor Mendel? You see, Gregor Mendel, even if you don't know much about genetics, I would guess that you probably had heard of Gregor Mendel and his pea plants. So Gregor Mendel, the scientist whose work proving the laws of Mendelian inheritance led to his later recognition as the father of genetics. So he is basically the man who started this field inside of biology, this field of genetics. He showed that there are distinct patterns of inheritance in the traits of pea plants. So before Mendel, people did know that there were some similarities between um, mom and dad and their child uh in terms of their the characters expressed it could be a genetic trait or it could be something uh, simple like a height or facial features but anyways he he showed he um what he did that was special is that mendel discovered the actual distinct patterns of inheritance um so that these um genetics later on uh, the, the scientists later on could use these patterns to discover more on the field, the field of genetics. So his work was rediscovered at the turn of the 20th century. So he wasn't recognized, his work wasn't recognized initially, but then his work was rediscovered. And he completed his most famous work while living as an Augustinian friar. Right. So before I talk about his uh, what his discoveries were, you basically have to go over these terms in order to understand. Right. So first, in Mendel's theory, there are something called alleles, or different versions of a single gene. Um, there are normally dominant and recessive alleles, two different alleles. A single individual possesses two alleles at a time. So as shown here, the genotype could be Big A, big A, small A, small A, and big A, small A. If since we have two options, so let's say we have two blank spaces that you could put put the two alleles in, right? You have two blank spaces, and you have to fill those in with two um, different types of alleles that you have. Then you could get these three combinations, right? So in the first case, the phenotype phenotype, which is the observable characteristic derived from the genotype. So phenotype, the genotype is basically how this is, it's how, it's how it's coded inside. We can't see it. And then phenotype is the result that comes from the genotype. And the phenotype of the first genotype, AA, is obviously dominant because both of them, oh, I forgot to mention that the big A represents dominant allele. The small a um, normally represents recessive allele. And big A, big A, obviously we, we, we will see the dominant feature, uh, whatever that is, it could be anything. But as I said before, double A, double A, big A, it will give you a dominant feature. And then small a, obviously, as did before with the big A's, it will give the recessive feature. And but however, in the case of the third genotype, where it has both dominant and recessive alleles, A, big A, and small A, 
this is when things get a little bit more complicated. So since we have, bo have both alleles, both type of alleles, we don't know which type of phenotype that uh, will be expressed. So we, we, the phenotype that we will be able to observe. But since the alleles, the two alleles, they're, um, so basically the two alleles, the one of them is the dominant allele and the other one is the recessive allele. And if you think of it, the reason why one is named dominant and the reason why the other is named recessive is because in cases like this, where this individual has two different alleles, dominant and recessive, the one expressed would be the dominant. And the one that is not, is that is kind of silenced by the dominant allele is the recessive allele. Hence the term dominant and recessive. Okay, next term, true breeding in the hybrid. The true breeding would be the first two genotypes shown here. The first two. True breeding is like the same thing, having two copies of the same thing. Uh, it's also called a homozygote. So true breeding and homozygote, homozygote, homozygous and homozygote are uh, synonyms. And hybrid, hybrid is the third one, the third one, the mixed one, and it's also called heterozygote. And it could be, uh, it, it's considered heterozygous. Um, in the case of a dominant phenotype observed, it is hard since the when the when the dominant feature of phenotype is observed. We don't know if it's this if it's either the, the first case scenario or the third case scenario because in 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 the eyes of of uh, the scientists you could only tell whether the phenotype whether which pheno phenotype it is and under the phenotype of the dominant phenotype there there could be both options number one and number three right so it's hard to distinguish whether the genotype of the individual is homozygous dominant or heterozygous dominant so whether it's hybrid, uh, hybrid or true breeding. Therefore, researchers may conduct a genetic cross to test this. So basically this one, this would be a genetic example of a genetic cross, this uh, picture. And P, F1 and F2 generation is a useful term to describe this process. And P generation um, is the parental generation. P stands for parental. And F1 is filial, filial one, and F2 is filial two. Pretty basic, right? Oftentimes, two parents are true breeding to create an F1 generation that are hybrids. So let's say it seems like the trait on the right is a little bit more dominant. So let's say this guy right here, the, the, the white bird, is a small a, small a. And then this, the, this bird on the right is a big A, big A. And then F1 would be all of F1 would contain, inherit one single uh, allele from each of the parents. So the, all of them would have big A, small a, which is a third type genotype. And by crossing two F1 generation, F1 generation are interbred to create F2 generation, they could be used to record and analyze the phenotypes. And the Punnett square is uh, the combination of the F1 generation alleles and the results that um, derive from this. And I will show you this later on to really um, help you um, integrate this idea. All right. So Gregor Mendel's discovery. So basically his discovery were, he discovered two laws in genetics. These are still used today and it's very essential and um, it's important, important to know. And the first one is the law of segregation. So as I mentioned before, um, when the parent, or the parent, uh, sorry, when the parent it had an F1 generation, it had, uh, it was a hybrid, right? So when you interbreed the F1 generation, you would only have so as I mentioned before, you could only give and give to your um, child only single of the single one of the two alleles. So law of segregation states that paired unifactors genes must segregate equally into gametes such that 
offspring have an equal likelihood of inheriting each factor. So out of the two alleles, the offspring must have an equal likelihood of inheriting either of the two alleles. So you can never receive um, you can never receive two alleles from the same same parent. The second law is the law of independent assortment. And let's say, as you can see in this photo, let's say you have two different genes and two different types of alleles that are not related. And each of them has dominant and recessive alleles for, uh, for its own, right? And the genes are Y and R. And these two genes, Y and R, as stated here, genes do not influence each other with regard to sorting of alleles to gametes and every possible combination of alleles for every gene is equally likely to, likely to occur. So, so in essence, it's basically stating that um, whatever, whatever the type of the Y gene is and whatever the type of the R gene is, dominant or recessive, it doesn't affect whether the remaining one either Y or R, uh, the, the, it doesn't affect the type of the remaining other gene. So it could be, it could have all combinations here out of this two. Y, big Y, big R, uh, small Y, big R, big Y, small R, uh, small Y, small R, and the same for the other, other parent, right? You can have multiple different combinations and multiple different phenotype observed at a different ratio here. And this is what I mentioned before. This is called the Punnett square, showing the combinations and the results. And it's also important to record pedigree. And pedigree analysis is often used by the researchers. We can deduce genotypes using a pedigree. Um, if conditions um, do not allow for interbreeding, such as human genetics, you can't arbitrarily make someone um, produce offspring with someone else, right? So we have to use pedigree analysis and we can deduce genotypes using a pedigree by, by observing the patterns. The patterns tell you whether the shade is dominant, recessive, or sex linked. Uh, it's important to practice them in order to do well on the exams. Uh, they're, on, they're on some of the questions. And the basics is this. So male is the square, is square, represented by the square. And female is represented by the circle. And those that are affected with trait are oftentimes, there are some discrepancies between um, different types of pedigrees, but oftentimes the affected individual is, would have a colored, either male or female, females would have a colored circle. And this C's, like this crossed, twins shown like this and then adopted miscarriage and all that and this would be the marriage line so this would be the mom this be father and the line of descent this this line connects the siblings so this would be um a brother this would be a sister this is the first generation this is the second generation so let's say um mom was affected she had colored and then dad wasn't and then uh, maybe this um, son inherits the trait and you can deduce the genotype from the the pattern shown on the pedigree and yeah so it's important to know how to analyze this pedigree next up genetic disorders in humans So basically, uh, in the pattern that I mentioned before, uh, those related to Mendelian and the pedigrees, um, these are the typical recessive disorders that are found in humans. And albinism, al albinism, symptoms of albinism include lack of color in the skin, hair, and the eyes, and cystic fibrosis is this um, condition where this thick mucus fills up the pulmonary and digestive tracts. And PKU leads to accumulation of phenylalanin, the amino acid, and it accumulates in blood and it causes many different um, difficulties. 
sickle cell disease, um, it makes the red blood cells, which are important for oxygen trans transfer along our body. Uh, they, this disease, in this disease, the red blood cells are sickled. It's, uh, it modifies the red blood cell in a way that it doesn't function well. And Tay-Sachs disease <clears throat> causes lipid accumulation in the brain and it causes problems to the brain. Uh, these are some dominant disorders. Um, Acronodoplasia is basically dwarfism, small height resulting from genetic disorder. Huntington's, Huntington's disease, it's uncontrollable movements. The, the symptoms are uncontrollable movements, cognitive impairments. This disease is deadly, but it persists um, even today. A lot of patients around the world and it persists more so because the symptoms strike in middle age where uh, patients have already had children. So they already pass on the, the, the genes. So they, these, um, although the symptoms strike and patients are affected in a uh, dominant um, uh, pattern, these, they, these patients already had offspring. So it doesn't, it doesn't, um, I guess, it continues to spread. Hypercholesterolemia. Uh, the symptoms are excess cholesterol in the blood and it causes heart diseases. Number three, non-Mendelian genetics. So <clears throat> up until now, we talked about uh, Mendel's discovery and Mendel's laws and the patterns and the disorders um, uh, derived from the laws that uh, Mendel deduced. And what we'll observe, what we'll talk about from now on is some of the gene genetics uh, that Mendel, that, that doesn't conform to the Mendel laws, right? So not, we call this non-Mendelian genetics. <clears throat> so as I mentioned before, these rules may contradict, you, th you may think that these rules contradict the, the laws uh, provided by Mendel, but this is because, as I said before, this is basically because it's non-Mendelian genetics. So incomplete dominance and co-dominance. Incomplete dominance, intermediate phenotype expressed in the heterozygote. So um, back in Mendelian genetics, when we had hybrids, so big A, small a, the dominant allele, there was dominant allele, there was a dominant allele, and it expressed the dominant trait even in the hybrids, same as the non-hybrid true breeding uh, dominant, right? But in this case, incomplete dominance, uh, when they have two alleles, it displays intermediate phenotype, which means that it's the, the phenotype is different from the true breeding dominant, uh, from having the true breeding dominant allele. So it would be this case where pure red and pure white interbred and it produces pink. The co-dominance is a little bit different. It's when both alleles are simultaneously expressed in the heterozygote. And uh, the one of the most famous examples for codominance is the ABO blood group. Um, so when we have both A's, <clears throat> the blood type is A, and we have AB, it's not uh, it's codominance. So we we state both AB. Yeah, it works that way. Pleiotropy and polygenic inheritance. Right. Pleiotropy is a case when one gene um, causes multiple characters. A one gene has effects on multiple characters. So the example of this would be sickle cell disease. So this one gene affects the red blood cell and it causes the cell to sickle. And the sickled cell causes many problems because it has important functions around our body. 
um, it circulates. So it causes many other problems. So it causes multiple problems, multiple characters as shown here. And polygenic inheritance is, is basically the opposite of pleiotropy. And it's multiple genes affecting one character. And as I've shown here, this is an example of polygenic inheritance. And there are multiple genes. And these combinations, you can tell, there are many, many different combinations for skin color. This would be the darkest of them all. This would be the lightest of them all. And also important, these pop up a lot in the test, in chloroplasts and mitochondria. Um, so we learned that DNA is stored in in um, uh, normal somatic cells, and <clears throat> so basically, chloroplasts and mitochondria have separate DNA. Surprise, surprise. So they are different from the normal somatic cell DNA and refer to the endosymbiotic theory in the earlier chapters. And cpDNA, which is chloroplast DNA and mtDNA, mitochondria DNA, are inherited from the mother. The inheritance pattern, inheritance pattern is maternal. So um, it can appear in pedigree problems. So when you see a pattern um, only inherited from mother. So uh, mother had this condition, a son inherits it, daughter inherits it, and then th the daughter continues to um, um, continues to have the problem and the daughter of the daughter continues to have the problem. You could pro you should be able to assume and deduce that the there is a problem in either mtDNA or cpDNA. Right, environmental effects. So basically, although DNA is basis for all genetics and um, phenotypic traits, um, there is this controversy, uh, nature versus nurture. And Environments can affect phenotypes as well. It's not all about the genes. Environments can affect phenotypes. We know this by uh, studying identical twins. Although identical twins are, um, by its name, identical by identical on on the genetic level, people can distinguish them. Although they look similar, they're designed the same. They're coded the same but they are not identical. They turn out to be different. And this is the effect of environment on the phenotype. So we call this phenotypic plasticity. And also related to this, um, there's a new field, um, epigenetics. It, it studies um, changes other than those in DNA sequences like um, DNA uh, um, methylation, acetylation, and so on. Linked genes. What are linked genes? Linked genes are genes located on one chromosome and near to each other. Crossing over of chromosomes causes recombination. We learned that last week. And this recombination frequency we um, scientists measure recombination frequency, and um, the the metric for this is the centimorgan. And we measure this. What we can tell by measuring the recombination frequency is uh, we can deduce the distance between the two genes by measuring the recombination frequency. Because when um, when the genes are close together, they're likely to move around together as a set when when even when it's crossed over correct so so if it's not recombined so if it is recombined 
So more if it's more recombined, then it will have greater recombination frequency. And it will be because the two genes are spread apart more so than the other genes. So by these recombination frequency in Centimorgan, we can one uh, the scientists can draw a genetic map such as this shown here. And the values are shown in Centimorgan, uh, Centimorgan map units, recombination frequency of 0 0.01, 1 Centimorgan. Number six, sex linked genes. Um, we are only familiar of the XY sex determination gene. But surprisingly, our system is X, X and Y is not the only system of sex determination. Some are affected by environment too, such as temperature. Um, as you can see, there is an XO system where a female has two X's and the male has one X. And for chickens, there's a ZW system. Well, female has a ZW um, um, sex gene and male has ZZ. And there's a haploid diploid system where females have diploid organisms. Females are diploid organisms while the males are haploid. And for, um, I think it was some kind of a reptile. Um, the, the, the sexes, they are decided by the temperature where the egg hatches. And there could also be a sex-linked gene inheritance. Uh, there are X-linked genes, Y-linked genes, and human sex-linked disorders affect mostly males because whether it is X-linked gene disorder or Y-linked gene disorder. So let's say the, the disease is X-linked, right? When it's, when it's X-linked and dominant, it would, it would affect both, both uh, sexes. But let's say that the, 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 the disorder is an X-linked recessive, right? Since it's recessive, when a woman inherits the X-linked recessive gene, I mean, the, the one with the condition, the disorder, since it's recessive, and uh, women have two copies of the X gene because their, their, their genes are XX, they won't express the disorder since it's recessive. However, when men inherit the X from their mother, they will 100% express that phenotype because it's um, recessive, but they only have one, the men only have one copy of the X gene, so they have to express it. And obviously in the case of Y-linked genes, um, women do not have Y, uh, women do not have Y, uh, gene Y chromosome, so it will only affect men. And by the same idea, by tracking Y chromosome, one can analyze male evolution. So this is analogous to, uh, this is somewhat comparable to the uh, chloroplast and the mitochondria DNA, which is maternal, and for Y chromosome, it's paternal. So thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, leave a comment down below. And yep, thank you for watching.